It's um, empty right in front of me. Fantastic. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the last session before lunch on day two of OSCAR 2017. I'll just uh, remind you all the classic things. Uh, put your mobile phone on silent, assuming it already is and probably has been for the last couple of days, and use the OSCAR 2017 app to rate the speakers uh, as you go. Um, this session, obviously being the last one before lunch, is um, Chris Coye telling us all about who Lidos is and um, what they've been up to. Um, and Chris um, is hoping to take a whole bunch of questions at the end, so if you want to hold them towards the end, I'm sure he would appreciate that. Please welcome Chris. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. So you're probably asking um, what I was asking myself about two years ago, and that was uh, who, who exactly is Lidos? Is it Lidos or Lidos? Um, so I'm going to go ahead and give you a quick background into who we are and why I'm up here. So that'll kind of help set the context for the rest of the presentation. So in August of 2016, or prior to August of 2016, Lidos was about 15,000 employees specializing in IT services and healthcare for the government and for commercial. But from a cyber perspective, they had a very prominent MSSP capability, mostly in the, in the United States. Now, you probably know who Lockheed Martin is, and you may associate them with F-16s and planes, but since this is a cyber conference, I assume there's people here that know that it was Lockheed Martin in the mid-2000s that, that developed the Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain and the intelligence-driven defense methodology. And so I actually come from the Lockheed Martin side of the house. And what happened last year in August of 2016 is that you took the existing 15,000 employees from Lidos, and, and Lockheed Martin split off 15,000 employees from its ISNGS division, which included its cyber component, and merged them together. So now we're actually 33,000 employees in about 50 countries across the globe. And from a cyber perspective, what's unique is that we, we combined Lidos's existing MSSP capability with the uh, advanced analytics and the kill chain methodology and a practitioner approach that Lockheed Martin took to cyber, which makes for quite a powerful combination. So that's, that's a bit of background of who we are. And it sets the context for the rest of this presentation, because I'm going to give you some examples of case studies of companies we've worked with um, over the last couple of years. So I've actually been living in London now for about seven years. And you, you probably can't tell by my accent, because I'm, I'm pretty rubbish when it comes to the English accent. But uh, one thing I wanted to do was pay a bit of tribute to uh, Sir Winston Churchill. And it, it really sets the, the, the stage for this entire presentation. What do you say? He said, you'll never reach your destination if you stop and throw stones at every dog that barks. Now, what's he talking about here? He's talking about two things. He's talking about distractions, but more importantly, he's talking about focus. And in this world we live in of cybersecurity, this theme of distractions and focus couldn't be more true. We have so many distractions that it's really limiting our ability to focus on what it takes to build up a cybersecurity program, a mature cybersecurity program. And I think just the last couple of weeks with, with WannaCry is a great example of that. There's probably some of you in this room who you needed to focus on WannaCry. It's something you need to take very seriously. But for others in this room, you're probably getting phone calls on Saturday from your, your leadership or the board and others saying, you know, what's this WannaCry? Do we have it under control? And you're like, yeah, everything's fine. We've got, you know, we've got our basics together. We're all right here. We're monitoring it. Or, you know, you've got vendors calling you up on the phone saying, is everything all right with WannaCry? How can we help? What can we do? Are you ready for the next one? And it really becomes a distraction. Um, now, what's unique for us at Lidos is we actually, given our heritage, we experienced our first major cyber attack in 2003. So this was an APT, it was nation, st nation state, and it was cyber espionage. So we realized all the way back in 2003 that our people and our processes and our technology were not aligned to get in front of these advanced threats. And so we actually went on a 10-year journey. That's when we developed things like the cyber kill chain to move really from a reactive to a proactive security posture. But there was a couple key things in there that, that worked for us as we went on this journey. And the first one is we empowered our people. Right up front, we focused on hiring the right people and empowering them and giving the authorization to do what it is they need to do. Now, in line with that is we had empowered people, but we enabled them with technology. And it wasn't the other way around. And we, to this day, continue to see this with, with customers, where they're empowering their technology and then they hopefully hire some enabled people to run it. And then the third thing, is it's guided by a framework. And, and when I say a framework, I mean like an analysis framework, like the kill chain, something that serves as the bedrock for all of your defenses. Not looking at a single event, but looking at the entire context so that your defenders and your IT operations understands that and can make the right decisions as they move forward. Now, for this presentation, 
I'm actually going to focus on three different case studies. And for these case studies, there's examples of companies that we worked with where we took what was a 10-year journey for us at Lidos and shortened that down for them to, to a two- to three-year journey based off of the lessons learned that we had done over the last couple of years. And there's going to be a couple key things that we focus on in each of these case studies. The first one, we're going to talk about myths. So what are the myths that were holding these organizations back from moving forward? And the second thing we're going to talk about are the truths. What are the truths that debunk these myths? And then finally, we're going to talk about enlightenment. So once these organizations understood the truth, what are the steps that they took to actually mature into cybersecurity organization? What is it that they focused on? So let's get started on the first case study. So when I say framework, as I mentioned earlier, I'm simply talking about a consistent methodology that all of your defenders follow to analyze attacks, to derive intelligence from attacks, to correlate that intelligence back to your campaigns, and to comply your, or to put your consistent mitigations in place across your entire organization. Now, given our heritage, we use the cyber kill chain framework, but obviously there's other good frameworks out there like the diamond model and using components of that. But what's key is that everyone is using the same framework, that you're, you're working off of the same sheet of music. And for this case study, what we had is we had a particular, it was a Fortune 500 financial institution. And this was at a time where they had went out and hired a bunch of really smart people. They were empowering their people, right? They focused on that right up front. But because they had all these smart people, they were overlooking the fact that they needed a framework. And what they had is this myth in their head that if we've got these smart people, you know, SANS instructors, people writing blogs, renowned within industry, if they're going to figure it out on their own. You know, we don't necessarily from the top down need to force any framework upon them. And what the problem was, when we dug a bit deeper with that, is that because they had these smart people, they could tell you what they should be focusing on, right? They could tell you what the latest blogs or the latest threat feeds or what the latest things in industry were telling them that they should be focusing on. But because they weren't consistently following the framework, they couldn't tell or they couldn't agree on what the latest threat landscape was for them. They couldn't agree on where to put their mitigations in place. They were literally taking different approaches to solving the same problems. So you can empower your people, but if you're not consistently following a framework, you're still not going to get to where you need to be. So what we did for them right up front is we chose a framework for them. And given our heritage, we, you know, we chose the kill chain framework. But we didn't stop with just choosing a framework. We actually trained them on that framework. And this is key. You know, all too often we see organizations that spend so much money training their employees, sending them to good courses, but you know, it's often based around technology. But how often and how much money are you spending on training your employees to follow a consistent framework? And we didn't stop with just training the employees. We trained the leadership, the CIOs, the CISOs, on, on, our, on our framework. So they, they could look at something beyond just a single event and look at the broader context and what that means to them as an organization. And I'll give you some examples today of how we actually measure return on investment as a result of following a consistent framework across your entire organization. But first, I want to show you how we actually measure the threat landscape by looking and following consistently a framework. Now, this is a redacted view uh, that we built for that cyber or that, that financial services institution. Now, what you have here, because it's, it's quite hard to read, is on the y-axis, you have a two-year time period broken down by month. Up across on the x-axis, you have campaigns. And then in the middle, you have your waves of attacks. So because this organization, for quite some time, had been consistently following a framework, they could tell not only when they were being attacked, but by whom and how often. And what's unique about this is if you look at, just as an example, APT Romeo here, first targeted us at Lidos in 2007, right? And there were certain characteristics that this particular threat actor did. One of them is they, they tended to target in the, in the spring time frame. Now, Fast forward a few years, and this threat actor went cold on the defense industry and, and IT services, and sure enough, shows up in 2012 on this financial services in, in their environment. Now, we told them a few things, and, and, and because they, the, the financial services institution, was following the same framework that we at Lidos were following, it made it very easy to share our tactics, techniques, and procedures with them. And that's what we did. And literally, they targeted, just like they did at us, they targeted this, this institution in May of 2012 eight times, didn't do a lot in between, then targeted them again in May of 2013 six times. But they were ready for it. So you talk about moving from reactive to proactive and predictive. Well, this is an example of how you can do that. But you can't get to this point if you, from the top down, you're driving into your team that we're all going to follow a consistent framework. And it takes time. So the next one we're going to look about is technology. 
Now, for this case study, we were working with a major utilities uh, organization back in the U.S., and this was at a time when the government was throwing a lot of money at, and, and incentives at them securing the grid. Everything is about securing the grid. So this particular organization did what a lot of organizations do, and they threw their money into technology. Right? They were every vendor's dream. They, they wouldn't buy just one product, they'd buy the whole suite. And so they really had that the backwards mindset. It wasn't about empowered people enabled by technology. It was about empowered technology, and hopefully your people can enable it to work as it's supposed to. Now, because they took this approach, they really had an out-of-the-box, set-it-and-forget-it mentality. Right? They were not empowering their defenders to put into custom signatures and the custom blocks and to get that custom visual visualization that they needed from their technology. And what we found out is um, there, there was actually a myth in there. What that myth was from when we got on the ground with their defenders is that they had spent so much time trying to keep up with the current number of alerts they, they had coming out of the box from all these disparate technologies out there. They, they, they were really almost afraid of actually tuning their environment anymore, putting those custom signatures in place. They said, listen, we can't keep up the way it is, right? D giving more vis visibility and customization is not gonna do much for us. And the truth was, when we looked at it, is that they, the number of, of events happening were actually increasing, right? And they were continuously chasing their tail. And there were a couple key things that were the problem. Because they were focusing so much on technology, they had really a duplication problem. Right? It wasn't about their defenders empowering them to make the right decisions. They, you know, their CIO or someone would go off to a conference, talk to someone, say this is a great technology, and start running with that. Right? So they had three or four technologies sometimes firing on single incidents, as opposed to just you know, one technology would have took, taken care of it. But they also had a problem with not understanding what it was on being too dependent on, the, on this out-of-the-box uh, technologies. And what I mean by that, the out-of-the-box... <laughs> on the out-of-the-box uh, signatures is that they, um, they, they were not empowering their defenders, right? So their defenders, the one who knew their environment best, did not have an ability to put custom signatures and blocks in place. So what did we do? Well, the first thing we did is we demanded a clear understanding of their technologies. We took the time to run an assessment, right? We aligned their technologies up against the framework and said, where are their gaps and where are their duplications? And where there's duplications, we streamlined. And I'll show you some examples of that here in a moment. But we didn't stop there. We evaluated the gear for effectiveness, right? So after the incidents came in and the attacks happened, we took the time to run the postmortem and understand where there were gaps. Where was the technology not doing what it needed to do? And that's where we empowered our defenders. We used things like Yara rules, put those custom signatures in place so that the, the IOCs and the things that we never just wanted to see again in our environment, and the people who knew our environment best were actually empowered to do that and not the other way around. And then finally, we planned for this increased visibility. I mean, we knew it was going to take some time, but in the end, by taking the, the time to actually focus on our technology to get the customization that we needed, it saved us exponentially in the end, uh, you know, really tenfold in being able to re respond to the events that came through our environment. Now, here's an example of how we measured this for this particular utilities organization. And this is what we call the campaign heat map, or sorry, the mitigation scorecard. So what you have on the y-axis this time is actually your threat actors. So not on the x-axis like before, but on the y-axis. And then what you have on the top, on the x-axis, is your framework, right? For this one is a, is a modified version of the cyber kill chain, and underneath that, we have our actual technology. So what we've done here is actually aligned our technologies up against the stages of an attack, against the framework, and against our actual threat landscape. And in the middle, we have where we've documented where we've either detected or blocked these certain threats coming into our environment. So we're measuring a couple things here. And the first one we're measuring is resiliency, or true defense in depth, right? So we know that with, with campaign alpha, if technology A doesn't pick it up at delivery, well then I know technology B can pick it up at, at installation, or technology C can pick it up at command and control. And literally triple checking our defenses against our actual threat landscape and against our framework. And the second thing we're doing, if you remember earlier I said it's key that you, 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 and you, you speak to your CIOs and your CISOs and you train them on how to use this framework. Well, we sat down with the CIO of this utilities organization. We said, listen, last year you spent 500K on this particular technology, right? And it got a big fanfare as it rolled out. It was a, everyone got spot awards and it was a big deal, right? And all this money that you had spent on this technology, when you looked at your actual threat landscape, it only blocked against one particular campaign. Meanwhile, over here in the corner, you have technology B. And technology B didn't get the same rollout and the attention as you implemented that into your environment. But when it comes to your threat landscape, 
technology B was blocking against 75% of those actual threats coming in. And when you can get to that point and you can, you can, you can measure this and influence the CIOs and explain to them this is, this is true return on investment. This is my resiliency. It makes it a lot easier to justify the need for more investments. I mean, 10 years ago, people couldn't barely spell cyber, and now we've got it all over the news, right? We've got the board's attention now. And I think if you can measure these types of things, this has worked key for us within Lidos and for our customers that we were working with for a few years. This is how they justify their investments moving forward. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about is people. Now, for this particular case study, um, we were working with a pharmaceutical organ organization that was quite large, and they had three socks across the globe. And they had a very tall order to fill. What they wanted to do is they wanted to staff these three socks with 30 analysts over an 18-month period. And we had done something similar at Lidos not long before that, and we said, you know what, we'd love to help you. But the first thing you need to do, the first thing is you need to get this, this out of your mind, this mindset that all defenders are cut from the same piece of cloth, because it's just not true. And you know, the, one of the first mindsets they had is what I call the, the Mr. Robot mindset, right? Which is a great show, love it, but, but not everyone is like Mr. Robot. You know, they thought, what I need to look for when we're hiring is we need someone that walks in with their hoodie on, probably shows up late to work, really good at their job, not really passionate about it, but, but really good at their job. But their passion, you know, their passion is when they go home, right? When they go home, they're walking downstairs in their mom's basement and putting their hoodie on and playing games and hacking websites across the world and overdosing on Red Bull and rinse and repeat and the whole same thing the next day, right? So there's, there's that mindset. And yeah, you obviously get some of that and, and that's great, but not every single network defender is cut from that piece of cloth. And then the second mindset that this particular organization really had was this mindset that, well, we need defenders that have a computer science major or they have a forensics major. And what we were able to convince them and say, listen, the technology that can be taught Right? The framework, that can be integrated into your environment. That can be taught as well. But the one thing that we as defenders have, and you're, in my opinion, you're either born with it or you're not, is that analytical mind, right? that hunger and ability to solve those tough problems. And if you're not hiring or looking to you know, cultivate from within your organization defenders with a natural analytical mindset, you're wasting your time. And I told them, I said, you know, at, uh, within Lidos, on, on, our, on, on my team, I've got analysts. Uh, one of them was a doctor at one point in time. We've got people who studied law, sociology. We've got musicians on the team. But the one thing they all have in common is, is that they have that analytical mind. And once we were able to convince this organization of that, we could really cast a much wider net for our recruiting efforts. So it, it got to the point when we were recruiting for these security operations centers that, you know, we'd see CVs or whatever that would have... 30 pages of every technology under the sun, which sometimes can be a good thing, but it sometimes just means that that person might be good at following instructions and not necessarily has that natural analytical mind. So, you know, we ask those tough questions, like I'm sure a lot of you do in your interviews about a plane leaves London and a plane or a, a, a train takes off from Singapore, all those things to see how they think and, and test them out. And that really helped us to start weeding people out and focus on the people that we wanted within our organization. Now, the second thing is all too often when organizations are looking to build a, a, you know, a cyber practice, they, they think, well, if we don't currently have these, these, these intelligence analysts within our environment, we have to look externally. And they overlook the fact that you've got people like your network admins and your system architects and the people who understand where your crown jewels are, but also understand where the bodies are buried. And why is that? Well, you know, they've been doing business continuity planning and disaster recovery for years. So if you can take someone like that within your own environment who naturally has that analytical mind and nowadays probably has quite a bit of security uh, background as well, you can go so much further. And that's, we, we pulled a lot of talent from within this uh, pharmaceuticals you know, existing uh, pool of employees. And the other thing with that is when you, when you look externally, sometimes you pull in talent, some of the best people out there, but they don't really necessarily can, are so concerned with what it is they're protecting. You know, they, they like their job, they want to fight it and move on to the next fire. So, you know, for us, both internally and for our customers, looking, looking within the organization has gone a long way for us. And then finally, you know, we, we met our challenge. We have, we've hired 30 analysts over this 18-month period. And then we had the same challenge that, that I have and I know that you have, and, and that's the retention challenge. And I know it's a problem because I've had, you know, director of SOX for banks come up to me and say, well, you know, how do you guys, how do you, how do you solve this retention challenge? What do you do? And I'm thinking, 
you know, you're the bank. Don't you just throw money at these people? Doesn't that keep them around? Like, why, why are you asking me this question, right? But obviously financial, that, that, those incentives help. But there's a couple key things that I think too often people overlook. And one is training, right? The, as defenders, you need to understand what the threat environment is. And you understand that it's constantly, constantly changing. So train your people and train them often. And, and don't just promise it. Actually deliver. We get so caught up in, I think, the operational daily activities that we forget about some of the training we, we promised. And, you know, I realize budgets are tight at times and, and that some of the courses out there, some of the best ones are five to seven grand a pop. Um, but there's other ways. And I know within Australia you have, I've seen some, from, from some of my team members, you have, you know, working groups, things outside where you meet at a pub, you do presentations. I mean, there's other things you can do to kind of cultivate that knowledge sharing if you don't have the full budget for training. Uh, and the second one is, is the thing with, with people with, you know, that analytical mind is that they tend to sometimes get bored easy. They need new challenges. So within our team, what we really work to do is switch it up. You know, if someone's fo focusing on host-based forensics, then maybe we can move them on to network-based forensics or, or uh, reverse malware engineering this year. And really, it, it helps to cultivate a sense of knowledge sharing within our team as well. So when I, when I kind of wrap things up here is, is if you go back to what Churchill said, he said, you'll never reach your destination if you stop and throw stones at every dog that barks. So from, a, from a empowering your people perspective, you're never going to reach your destination if you stop and throw stones at every stereotypical network defender. Right? They're not all cut from the same piece of cloth. But the one thing they all have is that analytical mind. From a technology perspective, you're never going to reach your destination if you stop and throw stones at every out-of-the-box vendor technology. Right? You can throw stones at vendors, and that might solve some of your problems. But if you're not consistently, if you're not empowering your people to make the decisions about the technology so that they can put the customization and the visualization that they need in place, you're never going to get ahead. And then finally, you'll never reach your destination if you stop and throw stones at everything that moves, at every barking dog. You can hire some of the smartest and brilliant people in the world, but if you're not consistently using the framework to, to make your decisions and look beyond a single event and put it into the broader context, you're never going to get ahead. So moving forward, um, it, it, as far as what I'd ask, ask you all to focus on is if, you, if you're interested in things like the campaign heat map and the mitigation scorecard, we actually have a white paper out there that, that takes it much more into detail. We've got a booth back here and we can scan your badges and everything. And it, it takes it a lot more breaking down of how we build that than I was able to do in just you know, the 30 minutes I have up here today. Uh, we also have some blogs out there that explain it, uh, more of these case studies and take it a bit more in detail as well. So hopefully this was useful, uh, made you think a bit, and there's some, some key nuggets and things that you can take with you as you move forward. So with that, um, I think we have probably some time for some questions. But uh, we've got uh, 15 minutes for questions. My apologies. Yes. Thanks. That was a great presentation. Just a question on the frameworks. Have you found uh, with the various uh, experience that you have that there's a particular framework that is fairly popular and is the NIST Cyber Security Framework, uh, one of those? And, and when you are talking about frameworks, are you talking about a multitude of frameworks such as risk management, yeah. cybersecurity, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah, and this is a key one for us. So in this presentation, what I was really going for was more the, the attack analysis framework like a kill chain or diamond model. You know, talk because I'm focusing more on your actual cyber analyst perspective, but you're right. For us, NIST is a key one. Uh, I've got a team in, in you know Europe as well, and so ISO and other standards we 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 make sure we're complying with. But uh, yeah, this one was focused more on that attack analysis framework. Frameworks are all uh, well and good, but what do you do if you get caught in the framework? Oh, sorry, frameworks, and um, they become the driving um, factor rather than the actual results and getting the job done. I think for us, we we tend to all too often. I think organizations focus on quantity and not quality, right? So they have their key performance indicators saying we need our analysts to close out you know, X amount of tickets in a certain month. And for us, we really drive the quality. So we do get stuck in the framework, right? We look at the entire attack life cycle to take the time to say, have we seen this before? Where have we seen it? How does this play into my bigger picture? And that's how we frame it up there again against our technology investments. So it's key that not just your, your, your analysts within your security operations center use this framework, but that your IT ops, the people managing the firewalls, the other elements use, understand the framework as well and why it is that you're putting blocks in place at delivery or at command and control if that makes sense. 
Yeah. Any other questions? I think everybody nice might be stunned. Um, well, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Appreciate it.